Jackie Small. She is a daughter of this house, and uh, the Lord has put a word in her mouth. And uh, I'm always grateful for how God uses her when she uh, stands in my stead. And I want to ask if you would just pray with me for her this morning as she brings a word. Father, we, we honor the great name of Jesus. We're so grateful for the power in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the reminder through Pastor Bryant that this healing in the name of Jesus. Lord, everything we need is in you. We pray, God, that you would, you would fill up Jackie Small this morning with the presence of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit. God, would you, would you deliver through her the word that we stand in need of today? Use her and strengthen her. Empower her, God, with your great anointing. Father, let the name of Jesus be lifted high. People be drawn to Jesus. People saved, delivered, reclaimed by the name and the authority of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Come on and clap to the Lord one more time. Jackie, come on up. Thank you. Can we, can we give God praise for our pastor and our leader? That we serve under a pastor who is open to the gifts of those that are developing in the church. Amen. Amen. And we give honor to our first lady. I'd like to honor my husband who's not here because he's home with the 23-month-old trying to get him ready. Let's see how he shows up and what outfit he has on and how his hair looks. I'm excited for that. I am so excited about this word this morning because this word has been on my heart for four weeks, literally. God has been pressing this on my heart for four weeks. And this scripture might seem a little bit familiar. Pastor covered this scripture a couple weeks ago. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He covered this a couple weeks ago. But the Lord pointed out something very specific in this verse that he wanted me to focus on. When Pastor was talking about how we have a lot of work to do in this nation, I truly believe that there is something that is prohibiting the body of Christ from fully being the ones to make that change in this nation. We should not just rely on the government. Really, the body of Christ should be the ones going and moving. And so what is it? Why are we not moving? Why, when God tells us to do something, are we not? What is going on? And so the Lord spoke to me in this verse, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. You can read with me. It should be up on the screen or if you have your Bibles. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Say, that's me. That's me. For my power is made perfect in weakness. My weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for this message today, Lord God. I thank you for every heart in here, Lord God. I pray that this word is divided specifically for how each person needs to hear it, Lord God. Meet us where we are, Lord God. Open the floodgates of heaven, Lord God, and rain down on us, Lord God. We expect a powerful move of God in the name of Jesus. Satan, you have no place here. Chains will be broken today in the name of Jesus. Chains will be broken today. The thing that has been holding your children back from doing what they have been called to do will not hold them back any longer. And we declare that in the name of Jesus. Souls that have been stuck, Lord God, going around the same circle over and over will move forward in the name of Jesus. They will no longer be stuck in their weakness in the name of Jesus. So we thank you for your word, Lord God. We thank you for this house, Lord God, that is growing your children to be disciples, to go forth and make other disciples. We praise you and we honor you for what you are about to do in this place. And we welcome you here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Well, we're in 2 Corinthians, and this is one of Paul's most personal letters. He, he's literally 
letting us into his life and what is going on in his life. And in this particular circumstance, he's wrestling with a weakness. And so I want to explore what walking in courage actually looks like when it comes to your weakness. How many of us have a weakness? Amen. Well, we don't have any liars in here. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So I grew up playing basketball, and I went on to play Division I basketball, and weakness was a big focus. You're, you were always focused on your weakness. For me, it was my left hand, so my right was my strong hand. And the coach was always saying, you got to work on your left hand. You got to work on your left hand. Your left hand has to be as strong as your right. You cannot have any weakness. Your weakness cannot be exposed because when your weakness is exposed, the defense will play to that. The defense will use your weakness against you. In fact, because I'm strong in my right hand, what does the defense do? They cut off my right, so I'm forced to go with my weak. So the world has trained us that weakness is bad. Our weakness makes us uncomfortable. In fact, we go every single day hiding our weaknesses. We try to hide what's unfavorable. If we just look at the beginning of time, Adam and Eve, when they ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and God said, where are you? What were they doing? They were hiding. They were covering themselves with fig leaves and they were hiding because now they knew something wasn't right. And ever since then, man has always known something is not right. And we've been constantly trying to hide something, to fix something, to get it together, to fix ourselves, to make it better. And so every day we wake up trying to be better here, fix the weakness and, and measure up. And really your weakness is anything that holds you back from being the person, the man of God, the woman of God that God has called you to be. Your weakness is anything that is, that is prohibiting you from being who God has called you to be. That can be morally, it can be physically. Maybe you feel like, you know what, I cannot do what God called me to do because physically I just don't have it. I don't have it, and it's not even like you can't be a model, it's just like, I cannot be a spokesperson because I just don't have it all together. Like, I, I haven't worked out, I don't have it all together. And so your physical appearance has become that thing, that weakness for you. For some of us, it's emotional. It's an emotional stronghold where over and over and over the message is played in your mind that you're just not good enough to do it. You're, you're just not smart enough. You don't have what it takes. There's something in you that lives in you that you can't get rid of, which means it disqualifies you from doing the very thing that God has been telling you to do. And that is living in you. And you, whatever you say, however hard you try to get rid of it, it will not go away. It follows you. You may be called to be a speaker, but you have a lisp. Yeah, we know. There was this guy in the Bible. Yeah, we know. We know about him, but you? No. There's no way because people won't take you seriously. They'll, they'll be distracted by your lisp. How could God possibly use that? You, you can't be law enforcement. You're too small. You need to be big and strong. Yeah, you can't run fast enough. You can't do that. You're not fully equipped. You don't have what it takes. You're not, you're not fitting the mold of what it looks like. You don't measure up. It could be habitual. Maybe you have a bad habit. Or maybe you have something that constantly tempts you. Maybe it's food. Maybe you can't go shopping at Trader Joe's because it's in close proximity to Cold Stone. <laughs> and you know when you pull in the parking lot, you gotta pass Cold Stone to get to Trader Joe's. And so you say, Jesus, I'm going to Giant. And it's that real for somebody. So for some people, that may be ridiculous. You don't even see Cold Stone, but for somebody, maybe. That is something that they are struggling with so bad that they can't even drive from A to B. I used to have bulimia. I don't think I've ever shared that, like publicly on a stage. I mean, I've shared that. But I used to have bulimia because I felt like I couldn't control what was going on around. What had been done to me, I now needed to control something because everything was out of control. And so I literally could not go from home, my mom's home, because I was a teenager, to the gas station without stopping and running in and getting a couple Snickers bar and binging 
I had binge with me. I would binge. I could eat a whole thing of Oreos, three rows, all three, y'all. All three rows. Now, nobody could see that. Nobody could see that on the outside, but that was my weakness. That was my struggle. It had me. And as Christians, I'm concerned that we walk around and we're still doing what Adam and Eve did and we are hiding and we're covering. And God is saying, where are you? And you're like, no, no, because I'm too aware of what I, I'm too aware of it. I'm too aware of myself. And so we hide and we cover and we try to fix and we sew more fig leaves together and, and we hide and we fix and we hide and we fix, especially those who are perseverers. If you persevere, you don't know when to quit. So you keep trying to fix and God can't get in there to do his work because you're so busy fixing. And God is saying, where are you? Where are you? But I learned that being fixated on fixing your weakness will prohibit you more than your weakness itself. Let me say that again. Being fixated on fixing your weakness will prohibit you more than the weakness itself. And we'll get to why, but you won't start your business because you're just not good at business. You won't launch the ministry because you feel like, I just don't have that piece of it that people are going to notice. And so you stay there. You don't write the book because you're not a writer. But God told you to write it. Hmm. You don't open the business because you have a real issue with finances. And you know that the the business will fail if the finances aren't in order. You won't go to school because you just feel like, you know what, I barely made it through college. How can I get my PhD? How can I get my master's? How can I get my PhD? I struggled through college, but God has been pushing you to go. So you don't do this because you don't have this. You're not doing what God told you to do because of what you know in reality. And so you're fixated on your weakness, which is worse than your weakness itself. And you're letting your weakness actually strangle your walk. You're letting your weakness strangle the power out of your walk that God is saying, if you would just release your grip. If you would just release your grip and come out of that place of anxiety. Yeah, because, because they didn't see you before you went on that interview. And yeah, you got it together, but they didn't see you. They didn't see you before you got up on stage and started singing. They didn't see you. They weren't home with you trying to get your baby ready. They didn't, they didn't see what was going on inside of your heart. They saw you come up here and praise God, but inside there was a battle so thick, so thick, that you were up here battling and it was between controlling, trying to control what that weakness was and, and trying to let God move through you. They don't see that. They don't see that when you as a man walk into the room, you feel like less than a man. That when you as a woman walk into the room, you try to be stronger and more powerful than you really are. They don't see that weakness. And so what happens is, is we start to own some anxiety and some shame and, and there becomes no grace. We don't know how to receive the grace of God. We begin to carry things on our back because we started with hiding and covering and now we're owning it and carrying it and now it becomes ours and so we're walking. And what I wanna challenge us to do is look a couple verses ahead uh, before this verse that we're looking at where it says, that a messenger of Satan was sent to torment me. I wanna focus on that for a minute because many of us do not realize or have not identified who the messenger of this thing was. You may have a core belief about yourself as an adult, but you fail to realize that when you were five and seven and nine and 10, that the abuse that you endured, 
created a core belief in you. And so even though maybe you're not experiencing it right now, what happened is was Satan planted a seed and developed a core belief in you and you never identified the messenger of that core belief. So what happens is, is you begin to own it as part of you. You begin to keep it as part of your identity and it begins to become one with who you are where you walk around saying, I am just not good enough. When in reality, it's Satan, you sent it and you meant to destroy me. You meant to torment me my whole life. And I see you, Satan. But in the name of Jesus, I'm a child of the Most High King. And I know my position. I am seated at the right hand of Christ. I am seated in heavenly places with Christ at the right hand of God. But because we haven't identified the messenger of these things, we tend to take them on and own them, which leads us to a place of shame. It leads us to a place of anxiety. It leads us to a place of loneliness where we just feel like there's no way I can do this. We feel inadequate. We start blaming. We start blaming, right? But we also start controlling. We start to try to control it. And so we control the things around us, like I talked about, because we feel like if I can't fix this, I gotta control everything else. It's like, it's like being a wife when you try to control everything in the house because some other stuff's not going your way. So you're just trying to control everything. You're trying to control the shoes, make sure they go in the closet. You're trying to control that the countertop is wiped off because those crumbs, oh, we got some husband, okay, all right. We're trying to control everything, but really it's coming out of a need of saying there's a core belief that I'm not enough, so I gotta fix everything around me to make myself feel better. And I'm never gonna actually start to recognize and face what's going on inside, so you start fixing everything else. And so it comes out that way. And so we have to identify the messenger. So we don't know Paul's weakness, and I don't know what yours is, but you have to be able to identify where it came from, who it came from. This messenger from Satan came to buffet Paul, not buffet, buffet Paul, which means to strike repeatedly and violently, to knock him off course over and over and over. It means to harm repeatedly over a long period of time. Some of us have been struggling with this thing for a long time. It may look new in the new situation, in the new season, but this is what God does. He tells you, he tells you, somebody in here is supposed to write a book. He tells you to write a book. And so it looks like all of a sudden you've understood this new weakness, but it's been there all along. But it's, it's starting to manifest itself because now he's calling you out. He's calling you forward. And so the seed that's been planted in you is not just any weakness. It's one that's related to your today wants to talk about uncovering yourself. This whole thing is, is about being exposed. It's about exposing yourself. It's about uncovering yourself. Like Adam and Eve, they cover themselves. We are going to uncover ourselves today. And really, we have to understand that your weakness is the key to God's power flowing through you. So where we see our weakness is something that stops us. God is saying, your weakness is what I need. God is literally looking for somebody in the body of Christ to say, I, here I am, I am weak, use me. Because all the strong people, he's saying, well, there's no room for me. All the people who are so filled up on themselves and not in a bad way, but in a I got it together way, God is saying, there's no room for me right there. There's no room for me right there. And not only that, I couldn't even get the glory from you because you got it all together because everybody sees how good you got it. So there's not even a, a way for me to get the glory out of you. So he's looking for some beat down, broken, hot mess Christians who will say, here I am, Lord. Here I am, weak as ever, don't know how I'm going to do it. But you say that your strength is made perfect in weakness. You say that your grace is sufficient. And I want to talk about that because Jesus is not referring here to the divine attribute of God's graciousness. We all, when we think of God's grace, we think of God's graciousness and this just overwhelming general attribute. He is referring to the power of salvation, you ready for this, that finds expression 
in specific gifts, in specific acts, in specific spheres and instances, individualized as extraordinary power. So when he talks about my grace is sufficient for you, it's not this just big idea of grace that we just can, can melt in this grace, but he's saying my grace is sufficient for you where I will literally bend down into this circumstance, into your weakness, and give you exactly what you need. And give you the very thing you don't have. Because what happens is, is when people have seen this weakness and I, they're gonna say, how did she, how, how did he, what made him just, what changed? What changed? But, but he's looking for someone who's ready to be willing and open to receive that. It's the benevolent action of God stooping down, I love it, stooping down to reach you in your need. The God that we serve, the King of Kings, who sits on the mighty throne, the name above all names, stoops down to you because he told you to open that business. He stoops down to you because he said, I want you to go minister to the homeless. He stoops down to you and gives you exactly what it is you need. He stoops down to you to do something nobody in your family ever did before. Right. He stoops down and he's just waiting for you to say, your grace is sufficient. I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness. I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness. And so we have three things here. Three keys to doing this, to make it tangible for us. The first one is to recognize. We have to recognize our limitations, our weakness. What is the weakness? We have to recognize what this weakness is. Psalm 139, 23 says, search me thoroughly, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Now I wanna clarify, search me thoroughly, O God, and test me and know my anxious thoughts. That does not mean that we need God to find out about us. It's not for the sake of him finding out about us. It's not for the sake of it being revealed to him. It's for the sake of him digging so deep into us and us allowing him to go deep in us that we let him expose us to ourselves. So search me, oh God. Know my heart, test me, and know my anxious thoughts. This is, what this is, is this is submission to the searching process. So you're, you're submitting to this process of, of letting God uncover you. You're submitting to this process of, of letting God search you and the ugly parts. And some of us have, have these areas in our lives where we kind of know about it, right? We, we, it sits there. We kind of know about it. But we've never really gone to God and say, what is this? What, what is this? So for instance, let, let's talk about this. So, for me, right, and, and we'll just get personal. For me, my father left when I was young, and so then things happened in my life that watered that, that kept watering that seed that Satan planted. And so as an adult, there was this need for affirmation, and my coaches, all my basketball coaches, there was a pattern where they had an issue with me, and so I would try to please them and make sure I did well. And so there was this whole pattern, so I started realizing, well, there's something wrong. I, I have this need for affirmation, but it was much bigger than that. So I saw this weakness, it was, yeah, it was a need for affirmation. And so I went through the healing process, forgave my father, forgave everybody, right? I went through all that, but it still was there. And I was like, why is it still here, Lord? So I felt like I knew my weakness, but, but God had something to reveal to me because when I asked him to test me, search me, know my heart, reveal this within me, what he started to do was he said, you're healed, but but you have a pattern of thinking and you've developed a core belief that you operate from this disposition all the time. So your core belief says, and here's the thing about a core belief, it's automatic. It's automatic. And we have coping mechanisms, but the core belief is really core. It's your core and it's what you believe. And so, there's no time from when your husband annoys you to you wanting to pop off. It's automatic. Amen. Amen. <laughs> let, the, let the church say amen. 
It's automatic. And so you, like, you know, like Paul says, I hate, I hate my sin. But it's become automatic. And you hate it. So you're aware of this, but, but God had to reveal to you that this was now a core belief of yours. This is actually your foundation for how you operated. So you have to recognize your weakness. You have to uncover it. And the only way to do that is to truly ask God to search you, to reveal it to you, to define what is this, Lord? What is this thing? And then next, you have to renew your mind and your speech. I know, he gave me that one last minute. <laughs> At first it was just renew your mind, and then before I left, he was like, speech too. I was like, oh, right. I think in, in, I think in the church we like to stay away from like life and death in the tongue because it's, be, it's become such a thing where it, people think that it's speak life and all of a sudden something appears. That's not what it is. But if I'm saying constantly I am not good enough, that is speaking death. That's what that means. If I am saying I can't get it right, I am literally now walking into this death of not being able to get it right. So I am literally speaking that. So it's not I'm speaking something into existence here, but it's speaking something into existence as far as your actions, as far as your reality, as far as what you believe. It's saying I'm not good enough and so you are not good enough. It becomes the reality and that's why it's life and death because you're either living it out in life or death. And let me tell you, there is so much power in your words. And again, the church likes to stay away from that too, right? Because of the prosperity gospel. That's not what we're doing. We're just talking about the truth of God. There's power in your words because even when you don't feel it, when you speak the living word, it's living and active. So when you speak something that's living and active, that has the authority of the name of Jesus Christ, it starts to take over the lie. So when you start to renew your mind and renew your speech, sometimes you may have to renew your speech to renew your mind on the word of God. Sometimes it may have to say, I'm more than a conqueror. No, you're not. I am more than a conqueror. No, you, you've been losing. I'm more than a conqueror. 20 years you've been losing. I'm more than a conqueror. All you've ever done is lose. I'm more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. All your family ever did was lose. I'm more than a conqueror. All you know is lost. And you say in the name of Jesus, I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. And that is according to the living word. So Satan, get under my heel because this is what I know to be true. And that is a alive and well and so you renew your speech and you start dictating what's happening in your house in your atmosphere you begin telling Satan what it's gonna be you begin telling Satan how it's going to be and you meant to come and harm me and torment me and harass me and you succeeded for 20 years for five years for five days but today but today, see, I've recognized my weakness. I've identified the messenger. And I'm renewing my speech in my mind. I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness. Literally, when you renew your mind, you are giving your weakness a cause for pride. And this is backwards. This is backwards for us. Think, like, when have you ever heard somebody say, I am so proud that I am really bad at this? I am so proud. But it, boasting means a cause for pride, to call attention to pridefully, to rejoice. And in verse 10, Paul is saying, that is why for Christ's sake I delight in weakness and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And I want to say right here, I take pleasure or I delight and literally means to think good. Paul is saying, I am well pleased in my weakness. <coughs> what? He's saying, not only do I find comfort in it, but I, I'm actually delighting in this weakness because it's balanced by Christ's power coming to dwell on me, to live on me. So he's literally gravitating towards his weakness because he says, when I am over here, I am so powerful because the power of God. So I can say, and I'll, I'll use this example. God told me to write a book years ago years ago I sat down 
every year and tried to write this thing. And I sat down and I was like, mm. and I started to write it and it, mm, no, no, didn't, didn't sound right and I would erase it and I would struggle and then I would give it up and the next year I would try again. And Now God never said go, he still had some things to do in me, he still had some things to work out in me, so I wanna make that clear. But it was interesting because I told myself, Jackie, you're not a writer. You're, you're not a writer. And I'm, I'm gonna be embarrassed when people who know I went to Brown University read this book because they're gonna see that I'm not a writer because I'm gonna be exposed. I'm going to be uncovered, uncovered. And so when you start renewing your mind, what starts to happen is, is it goes from I'm not a writer to Lord, people need simplicity, and that's what I do well. It goes from, Lord, I don't know how to decorate the things that I'm writing with great vocabulary, and it goes to, I will breathe life into every word that you write. And it actually, your sentence structure doesn't matter because the, the woman who reads it on the other end, it's going to jump off of the page because it's derived from my living word and it's literally going to plant into her heart and so I don't need your decorated vocabulary and it went from yeah but I don't my mind is all cloudy and I don't know how to organize it and he said chapter one is this I was like okay okay and so what happened is, is I start, to, I start to take this weakness and I started to shift it and I started to begin to boast in my weakness and I started to say, I am such a simple writer that there is a large group of people who are going to need this book because they're simple too. <laughs> Let's just keep it real. Somebody needs to hear plainly without having a dictionary and without having to, to look up everything in their NLT Bible because I'm writing in King James and, and somebody who actually maybe just heard about Jesus but doesn't really know a thing about him, somebody needs this book or maybe you've been walking with him for 10 years but you still haven't grown in him and you need this. And, and so I started saying, that's how I write. I will boast in my weakness because no, I know when I do, the power of God will literally rest on every page and come to life when she opens it. And so he just started to download everything on me. And so because I stopped complaining and speaking death and I started boasting, what happened was I was calling forth Christ's power. I was calling forth Christ's power. And the last one very quickly is rely, is rely on God. You've recognized, you've renewed, you've changed your whole perspective on it. And now he's saying, do you trust me? Now he's saying, rely on me, rely on me for it. So here's where you have your choice. You either let him move and receive his power, or you go back and you try to control it and fix it and hide it yourself right. and do what you've always done. But there is a world that awaits the body of Christ and I refuse to be on a team that's powerless. I refuse to have teammates that have no power because as your teammate, it is my job to help you realize that your weakness, let it out, boast in it because that's where we have power because I too am boasting in mine. And when I am hiding my weakness, I need you to come up to me and say, boast in it, Jackie. Because that's what the body of Christ does. Because when we boast in our weakness, that is when we are powerful. And that is exactly what we are to do to move the kingdom of God forward. Isaiah 40, 29 says, He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Do you trust that God will do that? It's what he says he will do. It's what he says he will do. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. So when you have no might and you have no power, I can assure you of this, you are who he is looking for. And I wanna, I just wanna say, it takes courage. It takes courage to walk in that. It takes courage to expose yourself. It takes courage to uncover, your, uncover yourself. 
And so just like Adam, God is calling you out of hiding. He's saying, where are you? Where are you? Just like Adam, you must be willing to come out. You got to stop hiding. Everybody stand with me right now. You got to stop hiding. Just like Adam, God is calling you out. If you want to be first, you must be last. The kingdom, it, it works backwards. If you want to save your life, you got to lose it. Don't cling to it. Don't cling to it. Don't hide it. God is saying, release it. Release it. Release it. Not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. Not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. Come out of hiding. Not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. Expose yourself. There is power literally waiting as you step forward and you say, this is my weakness. Yes, I've been ashamed. Yes, I'm not proud. Yes, I've been hiding it. Yeah, some people have seen. Maybe some people don't know about it, yeah? But I'm going to expose it today, and Satan will have no more power over me. I want to invite anybody forward who's ready to expose their weakness, who's ready to uncover what it is that they've been covering up. If you're in need of prayer, come on up. If you're ready to get rid of this thing, to expose this thing, to give it to God, God is calling you forth right now there is power on the other side of this this thing that has been driving you for years and years and years God is saying if you would just meet me if you would just meet me and know that my grace is sufficient for you and that my power is made perfect in weakness in your weakness then that's when my power can rest on you that's when my power can work through you and so right now, at this altar, lift up your hands, close your eyes, whatever you got to do, do what you do. Release it to God and say, Lord, here I am. And this is my weakness. Begin to just vocalize to him what your weakness is, what you've been holding on, what you've been trying to cover up, what you've been trying to hold on to, to make yourself look good, to make yourself perfect, to, to hold it together yourself. That thing that you've been holding on to so that your image can stay together, so that you can, you can look good publicly. That thing that's wreaked havoc in your home, that's wreaked havoc on your mind, that's wreaked havoc in your body, we give it to you today, Lord. Lord, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your children, Lord God, who have, who have recognized, Lord, that they have a weakness that needs to be brought to you, Lord God, that needs to be laid down at your feet, Lord God, that needs to be boasted in. And so, Lord, I, I just rebuke any shame, any condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We rebuke any lie that they've held on to in the name of Jesus. Satan, you must release your grip on God's children. You must release your grip on God's children in the name of Jesus. There is no shame and condemnation associated with this anymore. Lord, thank you for wiping their slate clean. Thank you for tossing it into the midst of the ocean, Lord God. Thank you. I thank you, Lord God, for what it is they are bringing to you, Lord God. Right now, I pray that they will begin to renew their mind, Lord God, and begin to see this weakness as something that all along you have been wanting to use for their good. I pray that they begin to see this thing as something that will literally be the bridge to maximum power in Jesus Christ. I pray that they begin to see it as something that's not stopping them, as something that they don't need to hide, but something that they need to expose and uncover, Lord God, so that the enemy would not have any power, but that so you would have power through them. And so I praise you right now in the name of Jesus. I praise you that they will begin to rely on you, that they will no longer take it into their own hands. They will no longer rely on themselves, Lord, but they will fully release it to you. And we thank you, Father, for broken chains today. We thank you for healing today, Lord God. We thank you that there is wholeness in you, Lord God. We thank you that you welcome us over and over and over. 
And Lord, I just pray for power to be put behind what it is you are calling each individual up here to do and each individual in this room. I pray there is power behind that and that it is your power and your power only because only your power has a lasting eternal effect. In the name of Jesus, whether it just be their marriage, whether it be raising their child, Lord God, that is ministry in and of itself. That is the first ministry. So we thank you for your work in this place today. We praise you and we give you all the honor and we walk and boast in our weakness so that your power and your glory may rest on us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wow. Did you receive that word today? I really hope you did. Jackie, you ran off too fast, daughter. You ran off too fast. Come on, come on back here. I'm so, I'm, I'm like the proud papa around here. I'm so proud to have this gift in this house. Thank you for submitting your gift to the house so God can use you. Thank you. Thank you for thank being you. a great spiritual father. Thank you. Father, we want to thank you for Jackie Small. We thank you for her gift, her anointing. We thank you for her obedience. We thank you that she listens to the voice of God so that the people of God can be blessed. Now replenish her and fill her. God, bind up every demon who will come against the word she taught. Lord, we pray renew her mind and get her ready to preach one more time. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Thank you, girl. You can be seated. I'm going to just talk for a couple seconds. I won't be long, but I just, <laughs> anointing can't be hidden. Tell your neighbor, if you're anointed, you won't be able to hide it. Yeah, and you are anointed. When you come to faith in Jesus, somebody's going to discover what you have. And you just need to stop hiding it. Amen. That was such a rich word. I sat there and took notes the whole time. I'm going to steal everything. When I, next time I preach, I'm going to just say, and Jackie Small said. The third time I preach it, I'm going to say, a friend of mine said. Fifth time I preach, I'm going to say, somebody, I, somebody said. I don't know who it was. That word was so rich. There's a healing in this room. Come on, somebody. There's a healing in this room. There's a healing in this room. If you, can, if you can embrace that word right there, your healing is about to come about. Amen? You know, the other part about that message is it's a reminder that so often we look at it the wrong way. That's what the Lord said to me. He said so many people have been looking at this all wrong, been looking at our weaknesses all wrong. And that's what the enemy uses. So we walk by faith and not by sight. There is no trash in the kingdom. There's no trash in the kingdom. They're just vessels that God can use no matter what we've been through. And I just wanna, I wanna encourage you. You really gotta take this word and massage it into your life. Um, and I wanna, I wanna challenge you Take this word to somebody you know. You need to let people know that there's, this is a healing pool. This is a healing place. So often people think they, they can only come together, come to church when they have it together. And somebody needs to know that there's healing that takes place at Messiah Community Church. 